watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian by New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bors Puya. In this week's program, we interview Yoron Adamson on ac academic freedom. We'll also be talking about uh, the uh, heinous terrorist attacks in several cities across the world, a UK government inquiry into Sharia mm. courts, uh, a protest in defense of fastifiers, an insane fatwa saying suffocate the lot, those who defy fasting rules and the hijab. And in our slice of life, we're going to remember a wonderful, brave woman's fight against compulsory veiling. Stay with us. In the two weeks that have passed since we last uh, broadcast our program, there have been several heinous terrorist attacks in several cities across the globe. Uh, we know in Turkey, in Iraq, in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Orlando, Florida, in the US. I mean, again, you know, terrorism is the mask taken off of the Islamist movement, isn't it? Yeah, and, and one of the things that you, you notice, irrespective of which country, there is one um, equal, there is one thread between all of those, is that the human beings has no value exactly, yeah. for, for the um, for the ter terrorist sort of movement, and the Islamists are leading uh, terrorist or you know uh, organization and pushing this through as a means of taking power internationally everywhere. And anybody who denies this yeah. actually putting his head in the sand. Yeah, and and the the reality is that um, it, it's just it has no mercy. It has no mercy, no matter who you are, what you're doing. You know, uh, there's no politics behind this. It's just sheer brutality. Uh, there, there's a fantastic uh, report, though I don't know if you've heard, just uh, recently, where someone saw in southern Turkey a suicide bomber coming into uh, uh, their mosque and he started shouting that he's going to explode himself. And they tackled him, beat the crap out of him. I would have paid good money to have been there. And he was arrested. So, hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. mean, that, that's, uh, <laughs> that's good news in a way. Yeah. But at the same time, this, this is, you know, that's what makes, um, you know, compromising with these guys uh, a, disc a despicable act. I think trying to sort of, yeah. uh, you know, trying to accommodate these people, try to have a policy of accommodating the Islamists. It's a political Islam movement, it needs to be yeah, uh, tackled, tackled, yeah. And of course, uh, one of the projects of this movement, one aspect is terrorism, the other is, of course, Sharia law in countries where it's not possible to have the full spectrum of it with regards to criminal matters like amputations, stonings. Uh, there's an attack on women and in the family in particular. So we know that in Britain, Theresa May, the Home Secretary, soon to be Prime Minister, has issued an investigation into these courts. About you know, hundreds of women's rights campaigners have complained about this inquiry, saying that it's not enough. Absolutely. I think one of the key issues is that has been raised by the, um, those people who are opposing the way this inquiry has been launched and it's going to be conducted is a narrow um, you know, remit of the inquiry that limiting it to best practice and finding where there is uh, bad practices and trying to weed out the bad practices. Mm. But actually the whole campaign for One Law for All, it's always been demanding that women should have fundamental rights and religious laws and particular Islamic Sharia law does not treat women and, uh, and men equally yeah, and discriminate yeah. against children. Yeah, I mean, and, all, all and, religious and courts are of that nature, including the Bethden, for example, the Jewish courts. What we're saying is that investigate them fully and uh, don't just weed out bad and good practice when it comes to women's rights. Any sort of restrictions, religious restrictions are bad. And if women are to have access to equality and justice, legal justice, it has to be separate and outside of the context of and, religion. And, yeah, and I think my worry is that the, the inquiry has actually is, uh, is flooding uh, the whole thing with the religious understanding of Sharia yeah, codes. Definitely. And people who have been, been appointed as advisors, they actually have fundamentalist view. And how could that be yeah. uh, a fair 
um, inquiry. Yeah, so it's a whitewash we're calling for a fair inquiry, a judge-led inquiry. So it's something that we're seeing more and more uh, coverage on this issue. Uh, lots of, you know, wonderful women's rights campaigners and individuals have joined the campaign and hopefully it's something that will have a real effect on the rights of women in this country, minority women in this country. As a final piece of news, we wanted to talk about the protest against uh, forced of fasting in many countries and the fact that people are persecuted for it. We had a wonderful protest in front of various embassies in Britain, in London, Iranian embassy, Bangladeshi, um, Saudi, Moroccan, and Pakistani. Pakistani. It was fantastic. Um, and it was just in defense of, uh, you know, people who are being persecuted for defying fasting rules. Yes, I mean, while uh, the um, soft Islamism, we try to celebrate Eid and, um, and Ramadan, the reality is that one of the five pillars of Islam is compulsory. And as far as the Islamists have power and they have the strength, they'll impose it on everybody. That's why it's important from now, the earliest stage, to raise the issue of the right of people to live as they want and whether to they want to fast or not is not an issue, uh, is a personal issue, is not a public issue. And actually one of the issues that worries me is Mayor of London trying to sort of constantly promote mm. aid and fasting and Ramadan in public space. Mm. And um, we need to warn uh, everybody against this public notion of religious ceremonies. Recently, we interviewed Joran Adamson, and he's an academic who spoke to us about attempts at censorship at his university near Gutenberg in Sweden. Stay with us and listen to what he had to say. Thank you so much for uh, speaking with us. I heard about a scandal that took place at your university recently. Can you tell us exactly what happened? Well, uh, I had a course, gave a course, and uh, in the course uh, I could choose various things and I decided to give a lecture on John Stuart Mill and some key ideas in his teaching and, um, and so I did, I talked, talked about John Stuart Mill and I, among other things I said that, that um, while religions might not necessarily be true they still give people a sense of belonging, a sense of community and well a liberal society can't give you that because a liberal society basically says you know, the world is, is open, pick and choose, do what you want, unless you do something, you know, your life might be pretty, you know, pretty empty and so forth. And as I did this, when I gave this lecture, I thought it was a good lecture, just an overview, there was a, a Swedish Muslim convert, all dressed in black, with a white powdered face, sitting there in complete silence, looking at me. And then I thought, oh well, <laughs> see how it goes. And then... And two days later, I got a very long, winding, quite aggressive email from her, where she, there was a lot of, I would say, misunderstandings about science, misunderstandings about, about the university's role, and she accused me for not being neutral in my teaching, not, be, not giving a neutral lecture, whatever that is, you know. And, and she said that she would put me under surveillance. Yeah, so I was a bit, I was a bit, um, how should I say, I was a bit troubled by this. And then she signed off this long, pretty unpleasant email with the words, the student dressed in her pride. And, uh, and then I wonder what's going to happen now. And then after a few days, I was called in by the head of department and uh, some head secretary for consultations and discussions, they said. And I was wondering, what is this, what is this about? What's going to happen now? What is this? And what are the charges? And I said, what's going to happen? What, what might happen? And then they said, they answered, and I remembered very clearly, they said, well, you might get, get either a reprimand or you might get a warning. Why would you get a warning and reprimand? What had you done wrong? Well, my problem, my sin, my mistake, was probably that I lectured, had lectured on John Stuart Mill. 
in front of a person with a strong religious belief. And I, that's also what I said during this, uh, I mean, the first of a, of actually, first of a row, there were many, many of these consultations and discussions where I felt I was, I, I had these allegation, allegations, you know, whirling around me, against me, and it was pretty unpleasant. So I, I actually said that my, my problem here, what I did, uh, the, 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 I mean, the reason why I can get a warning is because I have been lecturing on John Stuart Mill. And, and then there were, there were one, one discussion after the other, and then a lawyer was called in, and there was a formal, formal allegation, and they said, we have to do this, uh, we, you know, because a student has complained, and the student said that she, she was, that she was, uh, had been discriminated against, both as a Muslim and also as an individual. But clearly, I never mentioned Islam during my lecture. I talked about John Stuart Mill. I mean, my lecture was not about me and this convert. The lecture was about John Stuart Mill and freedom of speech. You know. Why do you think it's come to this? And what, what do you think about the reaction of the university, which should have really sided with you? Well, I think it is appalling, you have to say that. It was University West, which is a little college outside, outside Göteborg, Gothenburg. And uh, I was shaken because I thought, and I told them, you are supposed to defend the intellectual autonomy of a university in the West, and you don't do that. And I think this is a disgrace. You know, I told them this. I have to be honest. You know, I'm, I'm a, uh, I don't know. I, I try to be an intellectual, and if you're an intellectual, you need to see things from various perspectives. And the only thing they did, they, they were, they were bending backwards to appease this student. And. Uh, and I think it sends completely the wrong signals, completely the wrong signals. And, uh, and this investigation lasted for about eight months. And uh, I sent hundreds of emails in all kinds of directions. And, you know, on and off I realized that I'm doing this, I'm playing this game, and, and, and the allegations against me are still around. And, and the allegations is, is nothing but lecturing on a classic, you know, one of the founding fathers of a modern society. And if you can't, I need to say this also, you know, with some emphasis, if you can't lecture on John Stuart Mill, who is, I would say, a middle-of-the-road liberal, who, you know, was defending the rights of women, defending a modern society, if you can't lecture on him, I don't know if you can lecture on anybody. You, can't, you surely can't lecture on Nietzsche or Marx, or anybody else, you know. So, so uh, this was a little bit of a rude awakening, and and I know these things are going on. I'm not the only case, and uh, well, we are being pressurized to, to. I mean, eventually, eventually the case was dropped. The charges against me were dropped, and then when they told me that, I asked them. So, have you now talked? Did you did you have a discussion? You know, a kind discussion with this Muslim convert, did you actually tell her that maybe you shouldn't do this because this is a university? No, we haven't done anything like that. So it's, it's, I feel like um, I'm just waiting for the next wave. And, and, and I know this is going on at other universities also. What sort of support can people give you and people like you? Sorry, can you say? What sort of support can people give you and those like you? Well, it's pretty evident. I think they should—they shouldn't support me. You know, I don't need support. They should support principles of a university. You know, because the university—and this is very important—the university, as as an institution, came about in response to a lot of religious religious oppression. You know, a few hundred years back. So the religion was a modern institution where you should be allowed to talk about anything. Yeah. And now, I mean, if you're a pessimist, you could say that the whole thing, we are rolling back the whole thing again. We are turning 180 degrees and then we are marching back into, I don't know where, but, but, but it's, uh, this is very frightening. And I think the, well, this is a huge thing. And I think, I think one of the problems here is a, is a kind of multicultural, you know, approach to education where people are supposed to, you know, where there is no solidarity, where there, is, there are no common values about, okay, what kind of society is this? You know, if we can't share certain values, if we, like, you know, escape into our, you know, various 
various ethnic enclaves, and that is, and I guess it will be the end of a modern society, you know, in terms of solidarity and in terms of of um, cohesion and trust and so forth. So I'm, and this is a this is doesn't look good, you know, does not look good. No. Thank you. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed the interview with Joran Adamson. I mean, it's pretty outrageous when you think about it. He's taught John Stuart Mill. He's hadn't even mentioned Islam. And it's just this offense industry gone into overdrive and more absurd than the Muslim convert complaining about it is the university taking it seriously. I mean, it's, you know. It's amazing. I think it's amazing. The, the irony is about the, um, the lectures on uh, John Stuart Mill and freedom of expression because he's <laughs> one of the proponents of the freedom of expression and women's rights and that's something every every student needs to study and debate and challenge that. I mean, that, that's what people, people used to go to universities to run away from religion, to run away from the family, learn new things, exciting, and then... Now they go for gender segregation. It's just <laughs> amazing and I think, the, I think the, the outrageous part of it is not just the Islamists and the religious trying to sort of suffocate a freedom of expression and uh, do not allow, not to allow any criticism of their ideas and religion. But the other issue is the institutions who are actually succumbing mm -hmm. to this pressure yeah. and acting outrageously. And I think the university that uh, Euron was at, and I think they behave outrageously, and I, they should be condemned. No, I definitely. Think and I think, I think definitely we need to be supporting academics like Euron Adamson. I, I mean, it's just reminded me of what happened at Goldsmiths uh, when uh, you know students tried to interrupt from the Islamic Society, tried to interrupt my talk. And again, it just shows that they, it seems that they have no idea what a university is meant to be. But it seems the universities have also forgotten what they're meant to be. Yeah. Uh, they're so busy kowtowing to yes. this nonsense. And I think one issue that I remember, there were a couple of key um, areas that the Islamic regime in Iran uh, um, undertook to mm -hmm. defeat the Iranian revolution and impose an Islamic uh, fascist government in Iran. One was to attack women and women's rights. The other one was the closing down of universities. Yes getting rid of all the academics and destroying academic freedom and freedom of expression. Yeah. That was the second pillar of the Islamic uh, regime. The third one was to arrest all the opponents, free thinkers, and, uh, and massacre a whole generation of Iranians. Remember these three things. Freedom of expression is an important part of the struggle against Islamists. The insane fatwa of this week is from Yusef Tabatawayi. Remember he is him? a uh, cleric. He's the one who said is the leader? rivers run dry because of the veiling problem. Uh, yes. What's that here? It's him. He's the fr Friday prayer, prayer leader. Friday in, prayer leader. Leader in, in Esfahan who who's actually did <laughs> say... You know, the, the main river in Isfahan, Zayan Darud, is dried All up. All the because... scientists, there's real reason yes. behind it, yeah. Yes. So anyway, now he said that uh, people who defy fasting rules, that's us. And hijab. People who defy hijab rules, and that's us. That's us. Yeah. Uh, they are worse than the kafirs. They are... Apostates. Uh, worse than the apostates. No, they're uh, corrupt. Monafiq is corrupt, you have isn't to, it? You, yeah, you have we're, to... We're you, corrupt. Yes, you have to get them and suffocate them, <laughs> but just get them and hold them and don't let them go, run away. Catch them and suffocate them. Yes. So that's his uh, fatwa. Yeah, very, very loving and peaceful, isn't it? Yes, I, religion I just, of peace. Yes, I just, you know, this religion of peace just gives me chills. <laughs> The slice of life this week is of this wonderful, brave woman. She's just passed away recently, but there's this photograph of her remembering her uh, when she stood up against compulsory veiling, uh, during a, a massive march of women's rights campaigners uh, against the Iranian government's yeah. imposition of compulsory veiling. Her name is Malike uh, Nikjumand, um, and she was an artist. Yeah. Um, Shida Rahmani was she, her stage name. Yeah. yeah. And um, look at this picture uh, <sighs> of her standing that epitomizes, you know, the whole resistance of 
women's movement in Iran yeah. has never died. Yeah. And people like her stood up against the Islamists and set the scene for years of resistance against the Islamists. Yeah. Which continues to this day, which continues And he's to going this to day. bury the Islamists in Iran. Remember this beautiful picture. Yes. Yes. Um, anyway, that, uh, that brings us. Uh, we, we are showing this picture though because she has uh, unfortunately passed away. She's been. She was in her eighties, um, and of course, she never saw uh, the day when uh, women could go unveiled in Iran. But that day will come uh, very soon, hopefully. Anyway, we've reached the end of our program. We hope you enjoyed our program. Do keep watching us and staying in touch. We love hearing from you. Until next week, have a wonderful week. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.